Thanks. Hi, guys. So, as you said, thanks. <laughs> as Pierre David said, uh, I will be talking about the Senate group, who is basically a group of attackers that we have been tracking uh, in the past year uh, at ESET. And so, basically, who are these guys? They are doing espionage. So, their main goal is to steal confidential information from their victims. And they have been active since at least 2006, uh, doing targeted attacks. And I will say that one of the particularities is that they are pretty skilled. And in particular, they develop their own malware, and they have a bunch of them, different malware. They also develop their own exploits, which is not so common f even for this kind of advanced group. And in the industry, they are also known as Fancy Beer, a bear, and APT28, or Sofasi. So basically, in this talk, I will first speak about the way this group infects their targets. And I will describe four different methods they have been using in the past and still currently using. Uh, spear phishing emails, which is a very, very classic one, but also, more originally, um, a custom exploit kit they built to infect their target, a method they use to steal webmail credentials, and finally, um, they trojanize so, some private applications to pivot in an organization. And I'm going to show you an example. And after that, I will talk about what do they do once they infect the targets and what kind of malware they use and uh, what are they trying to achieve. So they got different malware, as I said, uh, some for target reconnaissance, some for actual uh, spying on the targets. And they also built um, a small malware just to reach physically isolated computers. Um, so I'm going to describe this one also. And finally, I will give some hints uh, on who could be behind this group. So first thing first, how do they actually infect the targets? The first method is the very classic old school phishing method, the spear phishing in this case, so targeted phishing. And basically, here is an example. It's an email that they sent in September 2013. Um, it's supposedly about the APEC summit of 2013, which is an economic conference that happened in Asia uh, at this time. And they sent this email to a list of around 50 a military attaché from various countries. So you can see here Canada, France, Japan. And the text of the email says, OK, there is a list of journalists accredited for the conference. And the email has the signature of the real person in charge of the media for the conference. So I got the name, the cell phone number is the correct one. The Twitter account is also uh, the correct one. And um, in attachments, there is uh, two Excel spreadsheets. The first one is actually an exploit. So if you open it in a vulnerable uh, Excel, we get infected by the Sednit first stage backdoor. And the second one is just a decoy document. And if you open the decoy document, you will actually get a list of around 800 journalists, personal information, uh, email, including the passport number, and their affiliation. So spear phishing is really a classic technique for targeted attacks. But in this kind of case, we can see the, the pretty high level of sophistication from this group because they got a decoy document which looks uh, like a real one, and they probably stole it from somewhere. And uh, they got the list, the email addresses of the military attaché. The exploit they use in this case is a pretty classic one, but we also observed them using zero-day exploit in spear phishing campaigns in the past. So that was the first classic infection method. The second one is much more original for uh, targeted attacks. The Senate group built their own exploit kit. So basically, an exploit kit is a toolkit that is hosted on the internet on a server such that a visitor visiting the website, the server, will get a suitable exploit to infect its machine with some malware. It's a very classic way from, for crimeware, but for targeted attacks, that's the first time we see a group uh, doing this kind of thing. Uh, we discovered the exploit kit in September 2014. Um, we found three Polish financial websites that got compromised. And basically, the attackers uh, simply inserted um, two iframes in the HTML code of this Polish website, such that the visitor will load the URLs in the iframe. Um, it was the same URL on the free website. The first URL in, on the first iframe was not responding at the time we found uh, the compromise. But the second URL was still uh, up. So we started investigating around this particular domain name that you can see here, defenseiq.us. And so we started just browsing defenseiq.us. And what we noticed is that we automatically got redirected to the domain name defenseiq.com. 
which is actually a legitimate website a defense magazine. And it's this redirection to a legitimate website is actually a classic technique for the Sednit exploit kit. They always do that. The exploit kit is hosted on certain domain name, and if you don't visit the domain name in the expected way for the operators, you get redirected to a legitimate website that looks like the domain of a Sednit group. Um, so in our case, to get exploited, we have to visit the very specific URL they put in the iframe. So if we visit this very specific URL, what we got this time is not a redirection, but a landing page in JavaScript. So that's basically a bunch of JavaScript that will collect uh, some information on the machine and send back a report to the web server. So you can see here an example of a report. Uh, they extract the user agent. They extract the list of the plugins installed in the browser of a visitor. Um, it will serve to the server to give you a suitable exploit for your, com your, your computer, your machine. But that's, that's not the only thing they collect. They also collect the time zone where you are, the language of your machine, and the screen dimensions, for example. So based on that, uh, the server will give you a suitable exploit, but only if you fit the profile of the internet targets. If they target Polish and you come from the US, you are not going to get any exploit past this step. So just to sum up, the visitor visits the landing page. The landing page collects this report and give the report to the server. The server can then decide, should the user be exploited or not? And can I exploit the user? Is it vulnerable to something? If, you are not, if, if, it is not, if the user is not vulnerable, it is redirected to a legitimate website. But if it is vulnerable, and if we should exploit it for the user, for the operator, sorry, then um, they make the user download and execute a suitable exploit, which itself will download and execute the backdoor. To give you an idea of how it looks like from the network point of view, um, on this image, each line is a dialogue between the victim and the host. So the first line, the victim visits the landing page, gets the JavaScript landing page. Second line, the victim sends uh, the report to the server. But third line, basically the server tells the victim, just go to this website, which is defenseiq.com, and it's the legitimate website. So the visitor was not selected for the exploitation. On the other hand, if you are selected, uh, you got the landing page, you send your report, and on the third line, you actually are asked by the server to fetch a file, which is the exploit. In this case, it was an Internet Explorer exploit, and the exploit will then fetch on the same server the payload, the backdoor. And finally, the payload is executed on the machine, and on the last line, we see a payload uh, poking the CNC server. So this kind of selection on the server side is classic from Crimeware, again, but for targeted attacks, that's the first. And what is really, um, uh, I would say, specific to targeted attacks is that they try to focus on a specific time zone, specific language, and this kind of thing. Regarding the actual exploit, we observed we have seen three Internet Explorer exploits that they used in the past. And very recently, actually one month ago, they started using Adobe Flash Zero Day. That was patched two weeks ago. So that's another proof of the kind of technical level they have of the money they got to buy this kind of exploit. Regarding the development of the exploit, as I said at the beginning, we got the impression that it's, they just don't copy-paste exploits from somewhere, somewhere else. They have actually some development capability. Uh, for example, at the top, you can see a development path that was forgotten in a Flash exploit. And we have never seen this path in other instances of this exploit. So it really looks like they built the exploit themselves. Uh, you can see also two snippets of JavaScript, which are Internet Explorer exploits. And you can see that there are some comments. There is a to-do at the bottom left. And uh, uh, on the right, it's a rock chain um, that they commented. So they seem to actually develop the thing themselves and comment and work on the thing. That being said, the way they actually most of the time redirect the victims to the exploit kit is not by the iframe in infected website. This was probably just a first test at the beginning of the exploit kit to get some traffic on the exploit kit and to test the exploit kit. Now what they do is that they uh, come back to the spear phishing method, but instead of giving attachments in the email, they simply give a URL pointing to the exploit kit. So in this case, you can see an email that was sent uh, last March. Um, it, was, it was sent to a Polish official guy, and uh, it's basically about some uh, European uh, Asia energy matter. And if you click on the, uh, the domain name, is actually mimicking the one of uh, a real Asia news website. 
And if you click on it, you go on the exploit kit. Just to give you an idea, there is a list of domains that they used uh, in the last month to host the exploit kit. Uh, and each domain is associated with a legitimate domain, as I explained. So it's the same relationship that between defenseiq.us and defenseiq.com. If you don't visit in the right way the Sednit, the Sednit domain, you got redirected to the legit website. And as you can see, uh, most of these, uh, actually all of these domains, are related to geopolitics. So that gives us an idea about what kind of target they are after. That will be people uh, um, that are interested in this kind of thing, so NATO, diplomat news, um, and yeah, this kind of subject. So another method they use to propagate, it's not actually a method to uh, infect people, it's a way to steal their webmail credentials. It's not technically advanced, but it's still pretty original, I think. So it works like this. Um, basically, uh, a user um, is inside this webmail, in this organization webmail, he opens an email, which is a phishing email, and uh, sent by the Sendit group. And most of the time they use conference, security conference as a, as a theme inside the email. So there is a URL inside the email, and if you click on the URL, so the user click, there is a new window that opens inside the browser, and you arrive in front of this uh, new domain, which is controlled by the Senate group. And on this domain, there is a bunch of JavaScript that will, be, that will do two things. The first one is to redirect the parent window, uh, so the webmail window, the one that opened this one, uh, to a domain that is close to the webmail domain. So the parent window got redirected to another domain, belonging to the Sendit group, uh, and that is close to the webmail original domain. The second thing that the JavaScript code do is to redirect the current window to the legitimate website of the conference. So this window will be redirected to the conference website. The user is in front of the website, so he browses the website. And at some point, he comes back onto the first window, where now he's in front of a login panel, of a, a supposedly login panel of his webmail. So he got the impression that he had just been logged out from the webmail. So he says, why not? Uh, it could happen. So he enters back its login password, click on login, and actually what, it's just a fake login page, of course. And uh, by clicking on login, it's just redirected to the original webmail URL where he was actually still logged in. And the attackers just grab the login password. So regarding the implementation, just to give you an idea, there is an example they used in 2014. They were using a conference called Counter Terror Expo. And that's basically the page that is open from the webmail. So there is actually three snippets of JavaScript here. The first one is just a sleep function. They copy pasted from Stack Overflow. The second one is a obfuscated JavaScript, which actually does this window opener location to a certain URL. That's the redirection of a parent window, the webmail window, to another URL. And finally, this code just redirects the current window to the legitimate website of the conference. So that's it for the implementation. Another example is a fake webmail login page that they used. So it was hosted on one of our server a few weeks ago. Uh, so they, it's, it's a webmail for the Ministry of Internal Affairs of Georgia, uh, which is actually uh, accessible from internet. So they copy pasted the code of a webmail and changed the URL inside the code and hosted it uh, on some of, our, our, of their server. So that gives us an idea about what kind of target they were after. Another example uh, is a fake Yahoo change password page that they also host on one of their server. Uh, so they simply copy pasted the code from the original Yahoo web page. The interesting thing is that Yahoo put a HTML comment when it generates code for um, a visitor and they forgot to remove it, so at the end there is a comment saying that the, actually the code was generated in April 2014, so that's the date probably where they copy-pasted the code and put it on one of the server, so it's running for more than a year now. So that's it for the webmail, and uh, the last method of infection that we observe uh, in the last month for, from this group um, is also a very specific one. So here is the context. We found two binaries uh, that were compiled in February 2014. And each of these binary uh, contain two things, two binaries actually, inside. Uh, the first one is an internal application of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Uzbekistan that they use to manage visa demands uh, for their citizens. The second one is a Sednit backdoor, and both are packaged inside these two binaries. 
So once you execute this package, you got the two at the same time that are executed, so the legitimate application show up, but at the same time, you got infected with the sendNIT backdoor. And to give you an idea, here is the first case. It's an application called ilconsul that got executed on your machine. Um, so as you can see, it's written in Cyrillic, and it actually connects to a URL on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, domain. So it's really a legit application. There are a little doubt about that. And on the second case, this is the legit application called Visa Win. It's written Visa System in Uzbek. And that's the same thing. If you execute this package, you got this, but at the same time, you are infected. So the scenario here is probably uh, pretty obvious, is that they got access at some point to the location where the ministry saw the internal applications, because these are not really not public applications. I didn't find any sign of them uh, on the internet. They simply replaced the binaries in place with a Trojanite version containing the backdoor, uh, after that, they have just to wait for the employees of the ministry to grab the new application to execute it, and they infect these new guys. So it's probably a way to pivot inside an organization that they already compromised. So uh, now what they do when they actually infect someone with these all different methods that they got? Um, the usual process they follow is the following. There is a dropper first. And the dropper sometimes display a decoy document to the user, to a victim. The decoy document is here to make the user believe something legit just happened. And, but at the same time, um, the dropper also decrypts and executes the first stage implant of Sednit. So basically, they have always, so the first stage is a very simple backdoor we are going to see. And its purpose is to collect a few information on the machine and send a small report to the CNC server and the CNC server will decide if he wants to continue. So it can give back a binary or not. And if it gives back a binary, the first stage backdoor will simply decrypt and execute this binary and execute it. And that's really where the spying capabilities are. So I will first describe the first stage backdoor and then the second stage. So regarding the first stage, as I said, they come encrypted inside the dropper, sometimes with a decoy document uh, that shows at the same time. So regarding the decoy document, just to give you an idea, there is the one they used um, um, six months ago. It's a NATO-related press communicate that they simply copy-pasted from the internet and use as a decoy. So they display the document. And another one used at the same period, also related to NATO. So these are just doc files that show up on the user side, and, it, and at the same time, they execute the actual backdoor. So the backdoor itself, the purpose for the operators of this first stage, as I said, is really to answer the question, is, is this an interesting machine for us? Uh, in other words, is it a real target, or is it just a malware researcher playing with us? And uh, so that's the goal of this first stage. And to do so, they simply send to the CRT a report, as I said, containing the list of the running process, the computer name, and the version of the operating system. Uh, so there are not a lot of information inside the report, but it's actually enough, apparently, for them to decide if they want to go on. And then the binary will simply ask each 30 minutes to the CNC, do you got something for me? Do you want me to execute another binary? And I have to say that they are really suspicious. I mean, it's has been really difficult for us to pass the test, uh, probably because they know, as we see, they have already compromised a lot of organizations, so they probably know very well uh, what a vi real victim looks like, a real target looks like. So you probably have to got the computer name formatted in a certain way that is the expected way in this organization. You probably got, have to got some process, particular process running on your machine. And if you don't fit the profile, they will never give you something. Regarding the actual implementation of a code, uh, they take special care to be discreet on the machine. And uh, first, regarding the network communication, one of the things they do uh, is that each time the first stage backdoor contact the CNC server, they, hide, they try to hide this request between two legitimate requests. So each time it does a request to uh, the CNC, it also does just before a request to google.com. So you can see here a request to google.com. It's a HTTP post uh, with a pseudo-random looking URI. And of course, Google doesn't know anything about it. So it just answers 404 not found. But just after, there is the actual request to the Sednit CNC server. And it's always like this. They try to hide their traffic between legitimate traffic. So someone just looking around it rapidly will not see the Sednit CNC traffic. Another thing they do is that if the network request fails, they will try 
for maybe because there is a firewall running on the machine blocking the actual request to go out. Uh, they will try to do it from inside the browser by injecting some code inside the browser. But to do it, they will just wait for uh, a browser to open. They will not create a new process on the machine to inject the code because creating a process is noisy. It could be uh, catched by uh, antivirus. So they will just for wait for the user to actually browse something and they will inject the code to do the send it request. And the all, all the CNC domains they use are always mimicking um, software update domains. Regarding the actual binary, uh, in the first stage backdoor, uh, so this is really pro probably programmed in C, and uh, they use basically the always the same two techniques to make the detection and the analysis harder. Um, the first technique is that all the strings are encrypted uh, with various algorithms, and second technique is that they don't declare statically the name of the API functions that are going to be used during the execution. They, they fetch these uh, addresses at runtime. So for example, you got a snippet here where uh, you can see that there are calls to a certain address. Actually, at this address, there is nothing at the beginning, it's just zero, uh, because the address will be filled dynamically. So this address will be filled by this bunch of code here where we uh, got a series of get proc address API call. So the purpose of get proc address is to retrieve the address of library function. It normally takes in first parameter the name of a function that we are looking for. In this case, you can see just the beginning of encrypted string. So first, the backdoor will decrypt all the strings. You will get actually the library function names uh, written in memory. Then they, they execute this snippet of code. The get proc address retrieves the address of a library function. They are fit into memory. And finally, you can rewrite your code in the disassembly with the API calls and all the strings decrypted. So this is, this is actually a very classic technique for malware, but they always do that. Um, another thing they do in the binary is that they, one of the first things they do is that they, they fetch a Windows system library, uh, they open it, uh, so it's a classic si Windows library, and they fetch the actual timestamps of this, my, this binary. So the last modification time, the creation time, and etc. And every time they are going to, be, to drop a new binary on the machine, they will set the timestamps of this binary to be the same as the Windows library, just to not have a binary newly created that could, um, that could raise suspicion. So, yeah, S something interesting I found um, in a one specific binary four weeks ago. Um, it's a first stage implant of Sednit, where basically, after each API call in the binary, there is a print inside a file. And um, they write it into a file, and they write something like this. So you got a call to malloc, for example, then print a new line in the file, beginning with an acronym, uh, that indicate the type of API call that is logged, uh, probably COE for control of execution. Then there is a hardcoded constant that is different for each print operation. And finally, there is the return code of the API function. So it's kind of printf debugging. And so you got a file written on the machine that is basically an execution trace of API calls based on prints. The interesting thing uh, is that they never send this file to the CNC server. So I really believe that the, it's the way the developer actually debug the thing on his machine, and they forgot to remove the print code from the deployed binary. And that's interesting to see, like, how do they actually debug their code? So yeah. So just to give you an idea, the second value is the arcoded constant in the code. So it's like if you do print one, print two, print three. And this value is also arcoded, I believe, to be the t uh, thread ID, probably to debug multi-thread uh, binary, and the last one is the error code of the API call. You know, on Windows, zero means success. Another thing also for, uh, from three weeks ago, um, in a, in a, in actually in the dropper, so before the first stage backdoor, the in the binary dropping the backdoor, there was this function where basically there is a first call at the top that is a function that retrieves the integrity level of the current process. So on Windows, the integrity level is a measure of the trustworthiness of a process. And a process that runs at a certain integrity level cannot access objects that are at higher integrity level than its own. So they retrieve the integrity level. And uh, by the way, binary that got downloaded from internet run at low integrity level, which is the lowest you can get. So they check if the current integrity level is low. And if it's the case, they enter a loop 
And in the loop, they will execute an exploit for Windows 7 to escalate the integrity level to the system level, which is, um, which is the maximum. And if, a, if it is a success, they will set the persistence of the binary for all the users on the machine because they got the right to do that once they escalate the privilege. If it fails, so they will try three times the loop. If the exploit fails, it will end at the bottom left and only set the persistence for the current user on the machine for the backdoor because they don't have the right to do that, to do more than that. The particularly interesting thing is that this thing was actually a zero day three weeks ago. It has only been patched in the last Tuesday patch from last week. So that's another proof of the level of technical uh, involvement they got. So now, if you pass the test over first stage implants, if the operators decide that you are an interesting target, they go up to the next stage, which is the actual spying on you. These second stage implants, they call it X agent. So this is the name they give uh, to the project that, that is behind all these spying uh, programs. It's actually a framework to create programs, and it has been a long-running development project. We found signs of these binaries from 2006. We found the Windows, Linux, and iOS versions in the wild. Um, and basically, uh, x agent binary is a set of modules that they chose specifically for the target, and each module implements a, a small functionality. Then the binary also comes with several ways to communicate with the CNC server, and they can choose different ways depending on the target. Just to give you an idea, in the Windows version, there is the list of modules we found in the different binary. We don't have a lot of these binaries because, as I said, they are hard to get. And, and the name of the module is actually inside the binary. If you were there at the, at the presentation yesterday on C++ reversing from Eugene, uh, you have seen that the RTTI information gives us the name of the class, and it is, it is developed in C++, and the RTTI information are inside uh, the binary. So we can get the name chosen by the developer to name the module. So they, there is a module that is in all binary, they call it the agent kernel. Like the name imply, it's the execution manager. Uh, then they got a remote keylogger, what they call remote keylogger, which is basically a keylogger. And they got a module to enumerate network resources, which is basically the share, the Windows share, the over computers on the same local network. There is a module that abstracts the file system access and there is a module that monitors all the drives of a machine and look for very specific file types based on the extension. Uh, they look for doc file and they look for cryptographic keys. And if they found one of these files, they will um, extract the file and send them to the CNT server. There is also a module for, um, uh, which is just a remote shell. Regarding the actual communication channels, um, as I said, for each target, it's not necessarily the same communication channels. And it's totally, uh, it's made in an it's program in oriented object. So it's an, for the kernel, it doesn't know the actual implementation of a channel. Of a channel. It just knows that it wants to communicate with a CNC, and the actual implementation can be different uh, in each binary. So we have found uh, implementation in HTTP, implementation based on emails. So they send emails with SMTP to a CNC server, and they retrieve the emails with POP3 to receive orders. We found a binary where the, the actual communication channel is only by removable drives. Uh, so it's probably made for non-internet connected machines. They just drop messages on the removable drives and wait for messages coming inside from uh, USB stick, for example. Just to give you an idea, an example of uh, SMTP exfiltration channel we found in the wild. Uh, basically, the code, when they want to communicate with a CNC, when, when they want to exfiltrate some file that they found on the machine, they will log into this SMTP server, which belongs to the Ministry of Internal Affairs of Georgia. And to log inside this uh, SMTP server, they, they have a list of four logins, which are real email address uh, belonging to the Ministry of uh, Internal Affairs. And they got the password inside the binary, hardcoded. Uh, so as you can see, the password, they are probably generated by the user, like the eight, eight times eight. And so, they log into the SMTP server using an existing employee account. Then they send an email from the particular account of the employee to an, an address also in the same organization that is included in the binary. And they, app, they attach the file they want to exfiltrate uh, to the operators. Which means that they got the four login passwords of an e existing employees. They probably control, um, the, they surely control the recipient email address 
which probably serve as a central point for, to gather all the information from the infected computers inside this organization. And it also means that the binary was made specifically for this organization, and it's the only communication channel in this binary. So that's uh, another proof about the fact that they compile specifically for target their ex-agent uh, binary. A small uh, snippet of the ex-agent iOS version uh, that was found um, six months ago by Trend Micro, actually. And you can see j here the class, and there are min many different classes, but basically they can list the installed application on the phone, geolocalize the phone, record the voice, take screenshots, and they also use the same naming. So the communication channel is called X XA, probably for X-Agent, HTTP channel. And they forgot to remove a development path inside the binary. Uh, so you can see the iOS project, X-Agent. So there is no doubt it's the same kind of thing. Finally, the last malware I would like to talk about is um, a small component they built, uh, as I said at the beginning, to reach physically isolated computers. So that's probably just a standalone version of the ex-agent communication channel using removable drives. So the way it works is the following. You got two computers belonging to the same organization, and uh, one computer A and computer B. Computer A is connected to internet, and it has already been compromised by the group. So it's under their control. On the other hand, you got computer B, which is not connected to internet and physically isolated, so there is an air gap, and it's uh, initially clean. The idea is very simple, is that there is someone that uh, plug in a USB stick in computer A. Then the setting group will infect the USB key with USB stealer, which is the name we give to this particular uh, malware, and the infection is actually just a modification of the auto-run file of the USB stick. Then someone brings the same USB stick to computer B, probably because they want to transfer some data. And computer B at this point becomes infected by USB stealer, of course, only if it is vulnerable, by, um, only if it actually executes the autorun uh, file, uh, which has been patched in 2009 by Microsoft. But we can expect uh, air gap computers to not be necessarily up to date. And we believe that USB stealer was used before uh, 2009 also. So if computer B is actually infected, it will register its name on the USB stick. So the USB stealer binary got executed on B, and it actually creates a folder with a computer name on the USB stick. That will serve uh, for the operators to know which computers can be reached with the with, um, USB stick. So then someone brings back the USB stick to computer A, and at this point, the operators, they know about uh, computer B because they are, they, it has registered on the stick, and they can drop commands on the stick for computer B. You guess the, the next step. The USB stick uh, is coming back into computer B. Uh, the USB stealer binary see the stick, take the commands, and basically all the commands relate to uh, file searching. So these are commands to say, OK, give me all the doc files on this machine that were modified in the last three days. And uh, so the USB stealer binary executes these commands, grab the files, and put them onto the USB stick. And finally, the USB stick is brought back into computer A, where the operators can just collect the files. So it's really building a, a command and control channel based on USB stick. An interesting thing inside these USB stealer binaries is that they, they got a list of hardcoded file names that they look for uh, on the air gapped machine. So we found two different lists um, in various binaries. So we actually don't know um, anything about these binary names. Um, so we can guess that, for example, the talgar.exe at the bottom right um, is uh, Talgar is the name of a town in Kazakhstan. So that could be some private application used in some institution that they try to grab. And if you recognize one of these file names, I would be very happy um, if you tell me. So last thing, um, just to give you a, a very few technical hints on who could be behind this group. Uh, as you probably guessed from the bear. Um, so a first technical fact is the resource local ID. If you saw our uh, flash talk yesterday, you have already heard about it. It's basically resource local ID is a mechanism on Windows to allow developers to provide resources in different language. So on Windows, resources are um, the text of a menu, the text of a button, and developers can provide these resources in various language. 
The interesting thing is that if you don't select a language manually in the, comp um, in the compiler when you uh, insert the resource, the compiler will take the language of a machine, of a developer, and put this value inside the resource ID. So that means that when someone doesn't care about it and doesn't know about it, it will be the language of this machine uh, that is written here. Uh, as you may have guessed, 1049 that we found in many Sednit binaries. We also found a lot of binaries with English US, but there are a bunch of binaries that don't have English US. They have 1049, which is Russian. So that's the first technical fact. When you find a lot of binaries uh, uh, over the years with this value, it's kind of a pretty strong proof. Another thing we found in uh, XAgent binary is a um, debug path that they forgot to remove where um, it's written in Cyrillic, administrator, my documents. So that's a kind of mistake they can do. Of course, this, this can be, it could have been forged by someone who wants to point the finger at the Russian, but given the amount of small technical proof we got over the year, it's very likely that these are uh, Russian-speaking developers, which doesn't mean, of course, that it's Russia as a state that is behind. Um, and if you want a more aggressive version of the attribution, you can read the FireEye report. Uh, on this group. So just as a conclusion, I tried to convince you that the Senate group is really um, uh, doing long-running operation, mainly focused on geopolitics, and they are uh, technically pretty good. They always renew themselves, in particular for the infection methods. And just a some final thanks to Sébastien Duquet. I don't know if he's here, uh, because he works with me on the exploit kit and to all ESET Canada team, and by the way, we are hiring. So thank you for your attention.